Hello and welcome to StarK's Kosher Classes webinar. We're here in the StarK offices in Baltimore, Maryland. I'm Rabbi Tzvi Goldberg and joining me today is our Director of Development, Steve Seichel. Thank you, Steve. You're welcome. Thanks for coming. Um, Steve gets a Mazel Tov today, right? Your uh, grandson's bris. I want to wish you a hearty Mazel Tov. We're here every last Wednesday of the month at 12 noon Eastern. Uh, you can reach us at the uh, web URL learnkosher.clickwebinar.com forward slash kosher. And that's in the email that you should have received. You can sign up for our alerts and you'll be uh, informed of, of our classes and the times and so on if there's any change. If you want to join us by phone, uh, you can call 218. 895-1203. That's 218-895-1203. And enter the passcode uh, 2020. And uh, that should bring you and get give you the at least the audio uh, portion. We invite you to chat with us. You can see on the on your screen there is a uh, chat box that uh, can be used. And we hope that you will uh, uh, talk with us, schmooze with us, discuss with us, ask us any questions. And hopefully we'll be able to help you out. Uh, so I put on the email, uh, Steve, that uh, you have traveled in the past year 80,000 miles. But I think that that was, that was just this year, 2000. Four and a half months. In just four and a half months. I realized afterwards that I made a mistake. Uh, so in the past year, it must be well over 100, 150. 150. I, quarter of a million miles in the last 24 months. Quarter of a million miles. So that's mostly, is that that's air miles or? Yeah, just, just air just miles. Air, just, uh, just on one airline. Just on one airline. Okay. They must, uh, they must uh, like you, you know, they must know you already. You get to the airport. Hi, Steve. Um, so uh, you certainly have experience with traveling kosher, which is the topic of today's uh, session. Last week we discussed mostly um, uh, airline travel, airline food. Uh, that that webinar should be posted at, at some point on our uh, sister website, kosherclasses.org. At some point, it should be up there. Uh, so this week, I thought I would uh, invite you on. We can talk about some of your experiences, which are real-life uh, experiences. Not everything goes smoothly when you're traveling, um, I'm sure. And, uh, you know, we can, we can hopefully uh, enlighten the listeners on, on, on challenges that they may face. So let's see. What, what, what should we start with? Give us one of your uh, one of your uh, stories uh, that we uh, that we have been discussing a little bit beforehand. Okay, something thank un you. something unusual that might have happened. Okay, thank you, Rabbi. I knew that there was a mistake on the email because one of my very close friends in Israel emailed me to say, "Steve, there's no way you flew eighty thousand miles in the last twelve months." So I told him it was just a little typo, and it was just eight hundred thousand. It was just four, it was four and a half months. Um, tra as a Jew traveling, the, the main thing really is preparation, no matter what it is, whether it's food or airline or hotel or whatever. And um, I started telling the rabbi a story yesterday that I was a few years ago in Istanbul, Turkey for Shabbos. And one of the things that one of the issues that comes up in a hotel is that many hotels have electric motion sensor doors. So Talk about preparation. I spoke to the manager, the assistant manager, the hotel clerk, and everyone else in between, and I explained to them, I cannot use these revolving doors. So I went to synagogue that night. I had my Friday night meal. I walked back to my hotel, and I stand in front of the manual door because it was turkey. The door was locked. So I'm waving to them, and they just start waving back. I knock on the door. They tell me to come in. I am standing there close to 10 minutes until they finally figured out that I couldn't use the revolving door. So here's a case where I did all the possible preparation that I can, and you can still run into issues during, during anything that you do. So what you have to also realize is you need to have, when you're a, a, a Jewish traveler, you need to have a plan. And sometimes you need to have a backup plan. So let me ask you about that Turkey trip. Uh, 
you know, Turkey is not uh, currently the most friendly country to Israel. Were they, were the Turks uh, amenable to your request or they, uh, they, they, you know, they did it uh, because they had to or they were friendly? Well, the, the, the hotel that I stayed at was very close to the synagogue, so they were kind of used to it. But it's also interesting that the Chabad rabbi in Turkey had told me not to wear a kippah on the streets of Istanbul, that I should wear a baseball hat. So I would be walking down the streets. What about like a strimal? Would that work? Yeah, I don't know no. if that would work either. Okay. So, so something, I, something incognito. Right. You had to walk okay. incognito. So, um, and, and while we're talking about foreign countries, I was last May in Bangkok, uh, Thailand, talk about really being far away. And I had brought my hat with me for Shabbos. And I was staying in one hotel until Friday morning, and I was moving to a hotel near the, close to the Chabad shul in, one of the Chabad shuls in Bangkok. I got to my hotel room, and I realized that my hat was not in the room. So I go down to the uh, concierge, all these people, it's gone. The cab is gone, everything's gone. They can't find my hat anywhere. I brought my hat 8,500 miles to wear it, and I, I didn't have my hat. The next morning, on Shabbos morning, my phone rings. And I'm thinking, who could possibly be calling me? It's Shabbos in America. Nobody knows where I am. So I come down to the, to the front desk, and the manager is smiling. He hands me my hat. Uh, they, they somehow tracked the driver mm -hmm. and tracked everything, and finally and they had it delivered back to the hotel. So again... You always have to be, especially in a foreign country, you have to be cognizant of everything. Never assume that things are going to be things are going to be done. I want to go back to the the, 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 the Turkey the Turkish hotel. Um, uh, so you're standing outside the door and you can't get in. So it, it, it it's clear that the best way to get into a, a hotel on Chavez is through a manual door without using any electronic doors. Um, but Rabbi Heinemann does hold that if if there's no other choice, you could go through with a non-Jew. So if, if you could wait until a non-Jew comes and then uh, and then walk through together with him. He has activated the electric eye and you could uh, walk through. Now, but usually there is some, they do have some backup, usually, uh, to, to be able to use a manual door. I've been told that sometimes even if in the front door there is no, uh, no manual door, but the uh, staff doors... In the kitchen or back doors, the so. back doors they they don't have the fancy electronic door. They just have a manual door. So again, if you talk to them and you explain before before Shabbos, I need to to use a manual door. I'd like to use a manual door. They may accommodate you. The other reason they have manual doors is because if some reason the electricity right. goes out in the facility, there would be no other way for people to get in. Right. They didn't have a manual door because those doors somehow are connected to to electricity. Right. So. Um, Another another uh, issue is the uh, is the, the 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 floor that you're going to be on. Do you choose a low floor? I usually when you go to a hotel for Shabbos. I usually try to to choose the lowest floor possible, but depending on the hotels that you're staying at, that's sometimes impossible. Because in some, when I stayed in the hotel in Bangkok, because the the um, the city is so condensed, there was a ballroom and then a conference room and then parking lots. So the lowest floor was like 15th or 16th floor. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, but even if you, you stay on the low floor to avoid using, the point would be to avoid using the elevator, uh, which, again, Rabbi Heinemann has some uh, leniency on that. Uh, we, I have an article that I mentioned previously about hotels. You can find it on our website at star-k.org and type in hotels into the search box. And over there we go through some of these issues. But... Uh, people have told me that using the stairwell is not always a solution either. You probably come across this because sometimes it's locked, and so right. you could maybe you can get into the stairwell, but you can't get out. But you can't get out. You're stuck there on the bottom floor, and uh, That's you know I've ba had that also. banging someone to come get you. Right. And it's also electronically, uh, it's also electronically controlled. So you get into you go from one problem into another problem. So it's not always a solution. And again, preparation would be the, uh, the key to know what you, you know, how you're going to get out. Um, you wanted to talk a little bit about the, uh, 
uh, one's behavior okay. on 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 a on a uh, on a trip. You had you had a story we were with with Shmuel Kamenetsky. So one one thing I wanted to mention, I had written an article recently about travel, is that a Jewish person, whether they're wearing a baseball cap, like I said before, if they're wearing, a, if a man is wearing a baseball cap and and he has a beard, everybody knows that he's a religious Jew. So it's very important whether you're camping out in Wyoming, traveling to Istanbul, whatever your fancy is for travel, to remember that you could be going to an area, and many of us that work for Star K have this experience, where we go to areas where there are no Jews. In some cases, you may travel to an area, you, your family, may be the only Jews they see in a whole year. So religious, not religious, is very important to make a very good impression. I was many years ago in, in Detroit for a wedding, and I had the honor of traveling with uh, Rav Shmuel Kamineski, the Rosh Hashiva, in, in Philadelphia. And wherever we went, Jew, non-Jew, whoever it was, he had a smile and hello, how are you, for every single person who, was, who, was, who he came in contact with. Because our flight was so early in the morning, the two of us had to pray and put our tefillin on in the airport. And he tapped me on the shoulder, the Rosh Hashiva, and said, Steve, come on, we can't keep the point waiting. So as important as it was to, to, to pray, to him it was as important that we shouldn't be the last ones on, that when they call people to come on, that they should come on. Mm -hmm. One thing I wanted to mention about um, praying, and that is for you men in the audience, and that's to fill in. Ever since 9-11, September 11, 2001, there have been three or four planes that have been brought down in emergency landings because men have been wearing to fill in. Oh, really? I didn't know that. There was one in Atlanta. There was one, and right after 9-11 um, it happened, in fact, Within the last year or so, it's happened again. I know there was a, there was an altercation between a um, a person who was praying on the plane. He was standing there praying, um, the Shimon Esrei, the Amida, and and the stewardess asked him to sit down, and he was in the middle, so he didn't recognize him, and it became a whole to do. Well, obviously, if if you know a person anyway is allowed to pray sitting down if he needs to. And if the stewardess is asking him to to stop, I mean, they could be um, they, they may think there's some danger. It's 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 a uh, it's a tremendous uh, problem when you get into that. He shouldn't have been standing there in a, in, in a way where uh, he could uh, cause a commotion. But anyway, go ahead. So so so, so I really try to go out of my way whenever possible, and it's probably good advice for all of you that if you can just get to the airport 30 minutes sooner, of course, if the time for praying has come, and we're going to talk about the different internet sites that are available to help you as you travel, and that, that is to always try to pray with the fill-in on prior to getting on the plane. I was traveling, I believe, to California one time, and I had no choice. It was just, there was just no matter which lean, leniency you looked at, I had no choice but to uh, put tefillin on in the plane. And I was sitting next to this couple, and they, a non-Jewish couple, and they were very, very nice people. And another bit of advice that I always tell people is, if you're going to put on tefillin, tell the flight attendant. They really need to know. Because what could happen is, Somebody may see you putting on the tefillin. If you see something, say something. And they're going so to they're say gonna something say, to the right. flight attendant. The flight right. attendant might panic. She's going to run right. to the pilot. and Not everybody knows what it is. Not everybody knows what right. it is. It's always, and again, it goes back to sanctifying God's name in the way that by doing this, you just get, a, get all the possible hassles out of the way. So I'm sitting next to this very nice non-Jewish couple, and I'm explaining the whole thing. I'm going to put these boxes on my head and on my arm. And this very Irish-looking man turns to me and says, will you please say a bracha for us? So that was uh, a Kiddush Hashem, a sanctification. So you mentioned the websites that help you figure out the times. We have uh, the Chai table. What's it called? Chai so there, there, there are chai numerous, tables. numerous tables that could actually help you. There's a few things. If you have, and I'm not here advertising 
any uh, mobile device, but both the iPhone and the, um, the Android both have app applications, or it's, or it's called in the world apps, that on the sitter, on the prayer book, you can actually get on there almost everything you need, which would be myzamanim.com, which would tell you anywhere in the world, including now airports, you can put in the three letters of, of an airport mm -hmm. initials, and it will tell you the different times when to pray. There's also a site that's kind of like my right hand is godavin.com. Godavin.com you can either get from the internet or it's also in this many sitter applications. And that tells you where the minyanim are right. also. Right. I was, where can you find a, right. a, a shul? Right. The, the new app that I have, really the, the old app I had on my iPhone would tell me all minyanim within 40 miles. So if I was more than 40 miles away, it would say no minyanim, no, no synagogues within 40 miles. The new one that I have doesn't distinguish. So I happened to be on the island of Kauai three weeks ago. Where is that? And in Hawaiian Islands. And you it were? told me, it told me that the closest minion was 115 miles away in Honolulu. But of course, it didn't say on there that there's water in between those 115 miles. And if I wanted to, I would either have to go Take by plane boat. or by boat. Mm -hmm. So, and, and there's an, also another tremendous, tremendous website called hightables.com. Hightables.com. I actually think that that's. I'm not sure that that's the actual. Uh, uh, somebody website? can somebody can check it up. If is it high tables? I think if you type high tables into Google, you get to another site. Okay. Well, I was told it was high tables. Blue Vein's going to uh, okay. check it out. Okay. There is a site that you could put in your flight number, your destination. Right. When you have to pray on a on a plane, right. you put in your flight number, your destination, and this program even gives you the option if your flight is delayed right. and it will tell you when you could start whether it's the evening prayer or the morning prayer and sometimes it's not so obvious just from your traveling because right. you're going across time zones you may be going across a dateline and it's not always uh so it's not necessarily easy to know when to dive and i had once i was on a plane to israel and somebody came over to me um uh, and asked me if, if what time is, is is the morning prayer, and I told him um, it's really time for the afternoon prayer right now because he had been sleeping and he slept. It only takes a few hours of sleep to miss the entire time that one could pray the morning prayers, and it was really time. I told him to to, to pray two minchas, which is what you do if you miss uh, shachris. Let me just stop for identification. We're here at the Starkey offices in. Baltimore, Maryland. This is our monthly webinar. We're here every Wednesday at the last Wednesday of the month at noon. Not every Wednesday, not yet, anyway. Um, Eastern time. Eastern time. Uh, if you have any questions, if you want to chat with us, we'll be more than happy. Oh, there is a question here from Moshe. Do hotels overseas have automatic lights that go on when entering the room? Um, I mean, there are hotels... In America, that have have that as well. Okay, there are your, ways. Your, there are ways around that. What's your experience? The way that? The, the answer to that is, you're both correct. That both overseas has it, and also here in America they have it. It is actually something that's done to save electricity, because right. what they what they want is when you're not in the room, what they want is that you're not using the air conditioning right. and all the rest of the electricity. Mm -hmm. So the way around that is is to make sure that when you um, Get your keys that you ask for more than one key and you keep, there's a, there's a slot as you walk right into the room. If you keep your key in that slot, then the lights will not go off during that time. But some have sensors also. They, they sense that you're in or you're out. They sense that some, somebody is moving in the room. I've, 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 I've come across where somebody complained that when he was sleeping, everything went off because he wasn't moving around right. and he was, he was quite uh, warm. This goes evening. back to preparation again. You need to know you what kind of hotel room right, you're what, staying what in. They're having. Another point uh, that I've come across is that when you open the balcony door, if there's a balcony and you open the door, sometimes it's rigged so that the air conditioning goes off because they they figure, well, if you're going out to the balcony, you're not in the room. Plus, they don't want to have all the the uh, you know the hot air coming in to the room, so they that that uh, turns off the air conditioning or the heat. And you don't want to do that on the Shabbos or Yom Tif, so you have to be careful with that. Two summers ago, I was in Milan, 
for, for Shabbos, and there it was even more problematic. It was a hotel that was recommended to me by somebody that works in conjunction with the Star K in Milan, told me to stay in a certain hotel, and it turns out this hotel had light sensors in the hallways. So I had to stand there for an hour, peeking out, waiting for the light to go on. Because what happens is as soon as you walked into the hallway, as soon as you walked into the hallway, the light would go on. You might be able to ask a, uh, a non-Jewish uh, staff to uh, walk you up. Uh, that might be... Well, this was in the morning when I wanted to go to synagogue. Oh, mm -hmm. it, it's also... Um, the rabbi mentioned about times. There are certain times a year when it gets a little bit more problematic to travel, especially when you're crossing the international date line. On my first trip to Bangkok many years ago, one, one of the rabbis here, Rabbi Heber, who's a specialist when it comes to times, I went to discuss with him the issue of um, counting the Omer and crossing the international date line. And when we discussed this whole issue, he said to me, that's not a problem. That you can work out. When are you leaving? I said, I'm leaving on Saturday night on Motsi Shabbos. He says, that's your problem. So try to imagine this. In Bangkok, Shabbos was over. I made Abdullah. I went into a cab, did all kind of malachas. I got on the plane. It was Shabbos again. Because you're traveling into... Because I was tra according to the Chazoni, I was traveling into Shabbos. Mm -hmm. and, and again, preparation. Since that time, and other people here that, that also travel to the Far East, make it a point not to travel on Saturday night or even Sunday morning back to if, America. If, if you're if you're going to cross the date line. Right. Just as you mentioned that article, so Rabbi Heber uh, redid that article and it's coming out in our Kashrus Currents this, uh, this summer. So you can see the redone article in either on our website or uh, maybe you get it in, in one of the, the newspapers. I think it's in Hamodia and Yatayd. It comes into those newspapers. Rick in Columbus says, uh, since 9-11, almost every time I fly out of Columbus, I get stopped at security because of the silver atara on my talus, which I always have on my carry-on. Okay. Uh, some people have a silver band that goes on their, on their prayer talus. Only once was I questioned about my feeling. <laughs> my advice to that, Rick, would be, and this is what I do when I travel to these backwards kind of places because I have that I have that trouble. Once a year, I travel to Midwestern Wisconsin and probably five, six hours from Milwaukee. And almost every time I'm in that airport, the security pulls me over for it to fill in. So what, what you could do to avert this problem, I would think, would be to actually open up your bag, show them what it is, and then I think... Once they see what it is, instead of them looking inside your bag and being worried about it, that, that may avert the problem. Mm -hmm. uh, Ruven, uh, our Starke text says the website is chaitables.com. Yeah. Okay, there you go. So it, is, it, right. it used to be something else, but okay, now they, it's chaitables. So you look at that, C-H-A-I-T-A-B-L-E-S.com, and you type in, like Steve said, you type in your time you're leaving and the time you're arriving, and we'll tell you all the uh, various uh, proper times for davening. Um, okay, you want to tell us about the time? You, you, I mean, you talk about the minyanim. You've gone pretty far sometimes to, to make a minyan, especially when you were in uh, mourning for, your, right. for um, your father. Right. Two years ago, my, my father had passed away, and actually the person that helped me with the minyan is in this room. And... Um, I got up from, from Shiva after the seven days of mourning, and I started traveling the day after that. And my scorecard, as I called it, during those 11 months were three countries, 18 states, and close to 30 U.S. cities that I traveled in during that time. But I want to share with you, again, an interesting story how when dealing with people that aren't Jewish perceive things, I was I, there, there's a city in Nevada that I had gone to during my time of mourning, and they promised me that they would have a minion, and unfortunately, they didn't have it. And that was the only day that I missed during pretty much my whole time when I was saying Kaddish for my father, Obashon. And to avert that problem, I went to another city in Nevada, which I know they would have a minion. And 
it was an expense to me, whatever, but this is something that I really wanted to do. So I, when I got off the plane coming home here in Baltimore, I normally park at an off airport parking lot and I'm on the shuttle bus. And usually if you've taken shuttle buses, people are tired, they don't talk. And I, it was just my luck that day that I got on a shuttle bus that had one of the most talkative women I have ever heard. And she not only wanted to talk to people, she wanted everybody on that bus to be involved in her talk. And I was doing everything in my power to, to avoid eye contact, anything to, to be part of this conversation. So the woman decides she's going to go around the bus and decide and, and say, where were you coming from with? So this one came from Harrisburg and this one came from this place and this one came from that place. And all these people are coming from places that weren't that exciting. She turns to me and she says, sir, where did you come from? At this point, I had no choice. I had to answer I said, Las Vegas. All of a sudden, everybody on the bus went, Las Vegas? Did you go to the shows? Did you gamble? Did you do this? And I'm thinking, this is unbelievable. No, I went to a meeting. <laughs> All I did was go to Las Vegas so that I could say Kaddish for my father. Now, I can't explain it to these people. So in a nice way, I said, look, I don't drink. I don't gamble and I don't go to shows. And then all of a sudden it was so quiet on the bus because they're thinking, what on earth could this Jew possibly be doing in Las Vegas if he doesn't do all the things you're supposed to do in Las Vegas? But again, you always have to be careful what you say to people. They might be impressed if you say that you went to okay. pray. All right. Huh? No, you don't. Think so. <laughs> I, I, it, 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 it didn't it, strike it like did that. Not, it did not seem like that kind uh -huh. of crowd. Uh -huh. Okay. One thing I wanted to mention, if you, a person does end up davening in their hotel room, which happens if you don't have uh, a minion, uh, they should be careful to daven the right way. Now, in a person's home, they know that they daven towards the east, which is towards Jerusalem. At least in America, in the, in the Western world, you daven towards the east. In uh, Japan, in, you daven towards the west. In Turkey, you daven south. In Iran, you daven uh, west. So, but when you're in your hotel room, you kind of don't know which way is east and west unless the sun is setting or rising. Um, I, 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 I've never tried this, but I thought an idea might be before you get into your, when you're in your car, most people, if they're traveling, have a GPS, and the GPS tells you w which way is which. So if you paid attention before you get into the, in, before you get out of your car, you could note which way is east, and then way you'll, you'll know which way to, uh, to daven. Um, there is, though, a, a halacha that let's say a person comes into his hotel room and he's you know he it's easier to daven in your room than to go look for a minion but there is a there is a rule that if there is a minion within 18 minutes of drive then the person is obligated to to go so you know you 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 you're beyond that you you you're going even if it's uh you know much further but the the bottom line rule would be if the, if there is a minion with an 18 minutes drive person would be obligated to go if it's further he's not obligated but it's you know if it's possible it would be it would be a good thing it's it's also um let me just see if there are any any questions anybody wants to discuss with us uh, on on the chat um rick says it's pretty pretty easy to become disoriented on the walk from your car to the hotel room you mean which way you're going and well that's what yeah, I was that's, I, rick i would again i would suggest it's also easy to, a lot of times a hotel will know, and also many uh, phones have an app that, that has a compass on it. If you have a smartphone, oh, you'll okay. find that most of them have a compass either already there, or you can download a compass for free. You just put it in your hand, and it will point you to, to east, east. To east. Towards east. east. Oh, I see. Okay, that's great. Okay. Using the high tech for, for Torah purposes. I would say, if there are any questions, any any comments or questions, please feel free to uh, to chat with us. Um, so, what else do you have, Steve, for us? Any any other good? Uh... Well, I don't know as much about stories, but I, I would like to say, when it comes to, um, I, I wasn't here for the for the uh, first part of the seminar about airplanes, but it's also important to note about food on an airplane. If you're traveling overseas. If you're international flights, right now, it's not as much of an issue because if you keep kosher, if you travel anywhere in the United States, you're not going to get a, a meal unless, actually, you're not going to get a meal, period. So what you need to do, it's important that if you are traveling internationally, 
to make sure that, in a, and again, in a nice way, that you let the people know that, for instance, if it's going to be warm food, that the food is double wrapped. Mm -hmm. I, I had it once on because, like Rabbi Goldberg said in the beginning, because I, I fly a lot with one airline, they give me special service. Most of the time that I travel in the United States and actually internationally, I get upgraded. And one time they forgot my meal. And the, the flight attendant said, she likes to eat kosher. And she brought me, I remember it was breakfast time, she brought me French toast. And it wasn't double wrapped. And I had to try to tell her in a nice way, I can't eat this. But again, you have to do it in a nice way. Another story is I was traveling back from Europe one time and they they were they served me this appetizer and it really, really, really looked good. The only problem I had was was that the non Jewish person sitting next to me had the same appetizer and there was no way that he ordered kosher food. So I called over the flight attendant. I was sitting in business class. I called over the flight attendant. I said, this is not kosher. They said to me, it is kosher. Now, it happened to have leafy greens in it, fresh leafy greens, which you never see in a kosher meal. In fact, if you get a kosher instant meal, you'll usually see a little note in there. They said, we're sorry, we cannot give you fresh salad. But because it has to be frozen. Because it has to be frozen and they're checking and everything else. And I and again and I look I'm looking at my meal and I'm looking at the person next to the meal. It's exactly the same appetizer. So again, here people think they're giving you. So you, like they say, buyer beware, kosher consumer beware. You can't always assume because you say it's kosher that they that they've given you a kosher meal. Right. Um, as you say, it's not such a problem in America anymore. Right. Because you because you because because you don't last, get food. last last uh, month we did talk about the peanuts that you get. The star K uh, peanuts, the star K peanuts, yeah. or, or uh, star K pretzels, pretzels, still. right? But that's just Southwest. Uh, is, is, yeah, it's just Southwest. Yeah. Most of the airlines give out nothing but nothing but um, cold and hot drinks. Uh -huh. Okay. All right, we're coming to the end of our uh, our program, and um, if there are any questions, we'll be happy to uh, to uh, entertain them. Um, let me see over here. Let me see anything else I marked down I wanted to, to mention. Oh, yes, when you're in a hotel room, uh, people who are keeping kosher often will bring food in and they'll leave it there. So if it's meat or wine and you're leaving it in your refrigerator and you're going out uh, to do, you know, whatever, you're going out during the day, you have to realize that the cleaning staff is going to come in and it opens yourself up to a question of leaving unwrapped or unsealed wine and meat, and that's a question the person needs to, to deal with. Um, ideally, they should wrap it up uh, before before you leave, like uh, make sure it's not what we call bustish in this island, mina ayin. That's something I think people probably just leave leave it in their room, and then they go out and they come back, and it's, it's something a person should be careful with. Yeah, I, there was a few things. Number one, if I have wine in my room, I usually hide it in an area that I know they're not going to go. They're not going to go into the drawers. So usually I will hide wine. When it comes to meat, the best thing to do is, if, you, especially if you're traveling, is if you go to any supermarket or kosher place, is to get vacuum pack meat and ask them when they vacuum pack it to put it in meal size, so it's sealed. Mm -hmm. And even if the cleaning help comes into the room. Mm -hmm. If they touch that meal, you would know it because it's it's totally sealed. And instead of getting like say a pound of grilled chicken in Divided one container, into, into say give me three different mm -hmm. vacuum pack, and this way you would avoid it. And it also most likely it will have the sticker as a sign from the kosher establishment that you bought it from. That's a good idea. Phil says some hotel rooms have a sensor over the door that, from what I gather, is just a sensor to alert the hotel that someone is in their room. I mean, I guess that means that people, um, staff walking outside could see that someone's in there. A little light on the sensor flash, flashes as you open and close the door. What to do? He means what to do on if you're there on Shabbos or on Yom Tif, How can you open the door? Um, this, is a, this is a problem. Um, find another hotel. Find another hotel. <laughs> you could have, you could arrange for the staff to come and, and, uh, and open the door and for, open the door and for walk you. walk in first. What about taking another? What? 
tipping over the sensor. That might cause an alarm. That might cause an alarm, or that might that might make it that if they don't see the sensor, unless you've already prepared and told them, they're gonna they're gonna have a, they're gonna take it off. Mm -hmm. I see. The sensor is where on the on the, the sensor is probably gonna be when you put when he you says when you open. Sensor. It sounds it sounds like the, the door opening and closing is what. Is what right. So, so my advice again, I will defer holistically to the rabbi. But if I was in that case, again, preparation, I would tell the hotel staff ahead of time. You're telling them before Shabbos or Yom Tov starts. Tell them what your needs are, and in most cases, whether it's America or anywhere in the world, they will accommodate you and walk you to the room and walk in the room. One other thing I wanted to talk about that the rabbi mentioned. Many people I know because I. I meet people that travel a lot over Shabbos, and that is some people do not allow cleaning on Shabbos. They don't want anybody in their room, whether it's the meat issue or the wine issue or simple thing like having the light on in the bathroom. You want to have the light on in the bathroom. When they come in, they're going to they're going to, they're going to shut all the lights. Mm -hmm. So some people will either ask for a late cleanup or they just won't get any. They just they tell they put the do not disturb sign on. And the staff will not come in the room the whole time. Mm -hmm. Oh, that will solve the uh, the problem. The, the food, the wine. They right. want the, the food right. and the wine. And, and your and your light issue. And they won't turn right. on and off the lights. Right. They no, just they'll take if you again when we talked about before that the room key that goes into that slot that controls the air conditioning. Mm -hmm. It could be ninety degrees out. If they clean the room, they're instructed to make sure everything's off. Mm -hmm. You can walk into a room and you'll have no air conditioning and no lights. Right. Um, so we, I just wanted to go back. You reminded me that we talked about uh, Rabbi Heinemann's opinion that you could have the non-Jewish staff open the door with the electronic key. Uh, some people are not, don't want to do that, which is understandable. And so what they do is they, they, they leave the door uh, unlocked. Or, so they will, will put some duct tape on the, on the uh, door frame so that the, the door can't, can't lock. It can't catch. Um, they do that before Shabbos, and then they put away their valuables, and uh, and then and then uh, when they come into the room, they want to lock it, so they just use the bolt, the, the secondary exactly. lock, right. and they, they bolt it. So um, that's that is an option that a person can do if he doesn't want to use the key. Uh, I did not put that into the article because I didn't want to take responsibility for. I, I, for, I, 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 I put that for you. I to put in the article. What, for, I, that's what I do. Either that. Also, Velcro works very good too. You can also use Velcro, and uh -huh. you put that over over the thing. And the good thing about it, if, if you, again, preparation, another thing to keep in mind is if you are staying anywhere for Shabbos, don't show up at your hotel room 10 minutes before Shabbos. Sometimes we're on business trips, and we push things till the end. It could ruin your Shabbos because you need, whether it's an hour, an hour and a half, to prep the staff, if you're going to get the door ready, all these other things. Tearing toilet paper. You got to remember in, in some homes, one person does it. And if you're not the one that do it, does it. If you have a refrigerator in your room, you got to remember to turn the light bulb off in, in, in the room. I wanted to mention one thing about refrigerators. Many hotels have what they call mini bars. Some mini bars have lights that will not go off and they are not, I believe they're, because the light will activate, you cannot use them on Shabbos. And there's another issue now, and I actually seen this. First time I saw this was in Israel. They have charge. motion sex. They, they have motion um, sensors on the actual food or drink that you're going to that you're going to pick up. So, so once you pick that up, right. it charges you right away. Right. So that also causes problems. So again, you need time if you're going to be in a hotel for Shabbos to be there an hour, even two hours beforehand, so you have time to do everything. So you could, even though you're away from home, have a as normal Shabbos as you can. That mini bar, whether it's electronic or not, will cause you a problem on Pesach, on Passover. Right. If there is chametz in there, uh, it could be an issue because even though you don't own it yet, and it's not yours, but you have responsibility for it if something happens to it. So if, if even if somebody else comes and takes that food out, they would charge you for it. And maybe you can go down and you can argue with them, maybe, but basically you have what we call achrayis. You have responsibility for chametz if there is chametz in, in the minibar. So what we recommend is that um, either you, you tell the staff, the, the staff, take out all the chametz. I don't want it in my refrigerator. I don't want it in my room. Or you tell them, 
uh, you can leave it there, but I'm not responsible for it. I'm not paying for it, and I'm not responsible for it. It's, if, if something happens to it, you can't come to me. And as long as the hotel agrees to that, then you would you would be all right. But you need to do something with the, let's say, if there's a bag of pretzels in there, you need it to do something with it. Most hotels will give you, if you ask for it ahead of time, a mini refrigerator. Or the other thing you can ask is, can you please, if it's not a motion sensor one and there's no light in there, you can ask them, and many times they will remove everything from the mini bar for you so during you your whole use, stay. So you can, so use, you can the, use the mini bar. Use, use, use the refrigerator. And not, yeah, well, the mini bar refrigerator. And, and we're not only just talking about Shabbos, we're talking about during the week. If you're, if you're in a place where there is no kosher food right, you and need, you want to bring food with you, you need, you, empty. You need an empty. Right. All right, Steve, thanks very much for being with us. Uh, again, we welcome you to join us next, uh, uh, the last Wednesday of June for our webinar. Uh, you can sign up if you want to be alerted to make sure you have the right time and, 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 and the right uh, website. Sign up at our alerts at star-k.org. I want to thank our technicians, uh, Ruben Chapman and uh, Debbie Rosenstein for helping us out over here. Uh, this webinar should be posted on our website, kosherclasses.org, uh, in the not too distant future. And I want to thank everyone for joining us. Have a very good day. Take care. And safe travels.